Climate change is here and is real. Its effects are becoming more visible every passing year, threatening our societies and future generations. As human impacts on the environment continue to worsen the situation, it is high time to change our policies. To do so, climate knowledge and action must rely on accurate and readily available data. Space technologies and satellite data have been developing over the past decades, achieving near real-time monitoring of our planet. They are now mature enough to translate into insightful tools for decision makers and citizens. Space agencies and public and private entities from many countries have gathered together into the Space for Climate Observatory. Institutions, research centers, NGOs, companies are all welcome to join this international network. Since its launch in 2019 by the French President Emmanuel Macron, this ecosystem has seen the birth of more than 60 applications to help local population and advance towards climate adaptation, mitigation and monitoring. These projects cover many environmental stakes all over the world. Extreme weather events, biodiversity losses, urban heat islands, tropical deforestation. The goal of the SCO is to act against climate change, as well as to work towards local adaptation. As an international network fostering cooperation, it favors the sharing of knowledge and methodologies. As such, our projects can easily be adapted from one geographical area to another. In addition, this alliance is now based on an international charter. It is widely open to participation to fully step up its role. We will collaborate to bring the wealth of satellite data and knowledge closer to the users. Only by working together to make the most of available means, we will be able to rise to the challenge of climate change. With the Space for Climate Observatory, the space sector is ready to play its part. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Laurence Monoyer-Smith, and I am head of sustainable development in CNES in Paris. And it's a real pleasure to be with you this morning and to chair this session, New Horizons for Earth Observation, Adapting a Society to the Impact of Climate Change. I'm really glad to see you here to discuss how the space sector can get involved in the fight against climate change for the benefits of all through the use of Earth's observation. Our objective this morning is to try to outline how sat satellite data can be used for adaptation to climate change all around the globe. We wanted to give you a sense of the kind of things that can be done, but also an overview of the many challenges that arise when doing so, be it data sharing, international and regional cooperation, or the actual usage of such tools. So this plenary session is sponsored by the Space for Climate Observatory. Have you, as you have seen in the film, we are an interna international alliance, signatories of a charter representing about 40 agencies and international organizations all around the world. We have created a platform to develop Earth observation-based applications and to cooperate around these topics. So far, we have 60 operational projects all over, all over the world offering tools to decision makers to fight and adapt to climate change. So it is my great pleasure to be joined today by six experts who will cast a light on how satellites might be leveraged for the benefits of climate. So please welcome Mr. Arnaud André, who's a co-founder of the company SGEVT, which is part of the SCO project Flood, and who will present it this morning. Please, Arnaud. Applause 
We have also Amal Layashi, Head of Capacity Building Department at the CRTS. Thank you, please join us. We have also Monsieur Stéphane Mermoz, researcher at the CESBIO and founder of Globeo and involved in one of the major projects, SCO project. Welcome. And Simonetta Celli, the, the director of Earth Observation Program and head of ESRIN in ESA. And we are extremely happy uh, to have with us Mrs. Sherin Zorba. She's coming straight from New York, where she was in the UN G General Assembly. So thank you very much. She's head of secretariat, UN Science Policy Business Forum on the Environment. Thank you. I wonder if we, we don't have, we're missing, uh, we're missing Rosa Maria Ramirez. I don't think she's there, but okay. Well, we'll, we'll keep on with our, with our fantastic expert and we start now. So, Thank you very much for being with us. And we are, we are here this morning to, to start from the, we're going to start from the, the closest to the ground. And then we, will, then we will talk about some very concrete projects before zooming out and, you know, from afar and seeing different aspects of the big picture of Earth observation for climate adaptation. So, so now we're going to start with Monsieur Arnaud André. Arnaud André, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you just a couple of questions uh, about the, the project you're working, you're working on in the SCO. Yes, please grab the mic, thank you. Um, and I want to dig into the FLOAD project. Uh, could, you, could you first explain how does FLOAD work exactly so that the, aud the audience with us this morning has an idea of the type of tools we are talking about uh, within and the, the tools we are developing in the SCO project. Yes, good morning to everyone. Thank you uh, for this opportunity. Flood, can you have uh, the first uh, slide? No, this is not the first one. Well. Okay. Well, we are going to do it without slides. Flood is about uh, building resilience to hydrometeorological uh, disasters. Uh, the principal objective of uh, FLOAD project is to help uh, decision makers to take action locally in order to mitigate the risk related to extreme events of torrential flooding. So we have no uh, The project started in the French territory called Aude, frequently facing extreme rainy events generating floods uh, with important runoffs. After a catastrophic event uh, that happened in October 2018, the old administration asked the CNES if satellite imagery could help facing these uh, situations. Focusing on the, specifically on the rural areas, the key questions they asked were, can we assess the potential impact of floods on a large scale? Size of flood is 6,000 square kilometers. How to slow down the speed of water flow? What are the areas most exposed, most vulnerable to water runoff hazard? And what are the action levers to limit and slow down flood water runoff and to reduce territory vulnerability? And more generally, how to raise awareness about climate change impact among the decision makers in their territory? In order to answer these questions, a NISCO project was decided led by a multi-skills private public partnership with all the local authorities at the heart of it. That is why the project is called FLOAD, is the compression of the word FLOAD, and ODE, which is the territory that has been using as a pilot case. So what has been doing this partnership? First, in order to raise decision makers' awareness, Meteo France, which is part of the partnership, analyzed the long-term evolution of extreme rainy events in Aude and more generally in Occitanie region. This was done through analysis of IPCC scenarios, Copernicus climate change 
service data, and local references. Indicators describing the extreme precipitation in the past and projections in the future has been elaborated to raise awareness. Second, Earth Observation Pleiad satellite Im images were processed with artificial intelligence tools for detection of damaged wine plots, log jams, land use, agricultural planting orientation, hedges efficiency, and repairing areas. And these, these outcomes, these results, has been integrated in data visualized indicators elaborated with local actors that can be reproduced and compared over time to manage the evolution of the situation. Third, an important effort has been made to collect examples of real-life projects, methods, regulatory obligations, and available funding support to provide to stakeholders specific implementation guidelines to help develop actionable plans. All the methods and tools developed in the FLOAT project are now available in an online platform for decision support, which is called FOR, that allows to visualize the climate projections of the IPCC scenarios, monitor the territory resilience evolution via a scorecard of indicators of risk prevention and reduction, and to propose examples of planning documents integrating the same indicators derived from satellite imagery and compliant with legal obligations. Satellite, on my view and the view of the partnership, is becoming the key to make solid, reproducible tools that meet the regulatory requirements and monitoring and evaluation of resilient territories over time. Thank you. Before I ask you the second question, I'm going to welcome very warmly. That's all right. That's all right. We're just starting, so no, no, no problem. So this is uh, Mrs. Rosa Maria Ramirez. She's the head of international affairs within the Mexican Space Agency. So we're really happy to have you over, and you have a time to, to drink, <laughs> to take a glass of water, and, and we'll get back to you uh, a bit later. So thank you. Now we have a, um, an overall picture of what FLOAD is, but the added value of the SCO is actually to provide very operational tools for end users. And as you have said, you have worked with them to design the tool. So can you tell us a bit more about how the tool came to be used by such value? Uh, such various users in this region of France and how the public and private partnership work in practice regarding uh, the distribution of this tool. Yes, that's probably uh, the key point. Uh, so as the, maybe the next slide, if you could show the public-private partnership slide. No, we, we don't have it. Uh, as the private company, part of this uh, partnership, we have been focusing on structuring a deployment process of these solutions so they reach the stakeholders and trigger action with a cost-sharing economic model, which is often a very important point. How have we done that? First, promoting direct access to FORO, the platform I was mentioning previously, and that FORO gives access to a wide amount of knowledge. But we did not want to float, if I may, decision makers with too much information. Only what is relevant for a specific decision maker focusing on a specific part of the territory. We often had to face skepticism about should I really do something. So that, uh, that uh, direct access provides to specific decision makers a synthetic self-assessment scorecard to assess risk. Do I have a problem in my territory? Where are the most critical areas? What are the key issues detected in terms of resilience to water runoff? Is it about edge? Is it about crop orientation, for example? And once the need to act is established, FORO provides with semantic tools, also powered by artificial intelligence, based on legal tech, uh, techniques, a selection of plans that matches the specific context to trigger action uh, for the um, decision maker. As a consequence, we, for example, Carcassonne, which is one of the cities of Aude, has started to include four outcomes into their climate change plan 
for monitoring their actions in terms of hedge planting and territory resilience. Also, the Chamber of Agriculture has started verifying four results that have been tough with us on the field with farmers and is now using four with a work group of farmers to improve agricultural practices. So that was the first thing, is direct access to four to get aware, do I have a problem or not? Second, indirectly, supporting existing organizations that can leverage four for their specific objectives and mobilize their networks to deploy uh, these tools. A great example is the Interregional Organization for Flood Prevention in Mediterranean area, which is called MIAM, which has decided to deploy this uh, four platform throughout the Mediterranean Arch, which is a huge territory of 23 French departments covering 125,000 kilometers, square kilometers. So for MIAM, we're adding what is specific for them, so they can use a platform also to deploy their own uh, objectives. But we also provide field support, which is very important, communications and training materials, either directly or teaming, which is even better, with local consulting teams that can help the stakeholders on the field. The results and good practice, are, of course, will be and are available to other departments. So I have to say that we are very proud to be part of this uh, public-private partnership and the results achieved, uh, with much more to come. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Thank you very much for, for this project, for uh, it's spreading um, in, in many, many areas in France. And now we are going to, to turn to, because the SCO is an in, in international initiative, so we want to know a bit, a bit of what is done in other countries. And w many countries are facing uh, different difficulties linked to climate change. And this is, uh, for instance, the case um, in Morocco. And uh, thank you very much, Amal, for being with us. So SCO is now being implemented uh, in Morocco by CRTS. So could you, could you tell us a bit, a bit more about how you have adapted locally uh, this idea to answer to specific needs, uh, and in particular in coordination with the governmental irrigation plan. So we stay in, in water matters, uh, which are tantamount, of tantamount importance in Morocco. So please, Amal, the floor is yours. Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, the mic. I'd like to a bit closer. Yeah. Yeah, okay. closer. I would like to thank the SCO for this invitation. Uh, the topic of uh, adaptation on climate change in uh, unprecedented topicality, given the large number of natural disasters in recent years, particularly in Africa, where the increasingly episode of drought and floods threaten millions of people. For this, the Space for Climate Observatory is an initiative of great importance, firstly, by the topics covered, and secondly, by the progressive approach of, of, to this implementation, based mainly on concrete and operational projects, and also multi-sector and multi-institutional synergies for sharing the knowledge, access to information, and development of EU-based solutions. Morocco, which is located in a region heavily impacted by the consequence of Check climate change plays the fight against the effect of climate change among its priorities at the national level as well as the continental and regional levels. It is in this perspective that Morocco launched during the COP22 in Marrakech the 3A initiative for the adaptation of agriculture in Africa. Morocco has been strongly committed for several years to development of EU-based climate adaptation project, project and solution to help decision makers and planners. Some example of projects in the area of optimizing water resources for agriculture or even monitoring drought during, using appropriate indicators or even the land information system project which produce information for the water balance and indicators on the impact of climate change. The activity of the SCO in Morocco reinforced this vision and consequently the joint declaration of interest was signed in July 20, 2021 in Rabat by the director of CRTS and the president of CNES. One of the first approach of this implementation is raising awareness. This is how webinars and 
meetings were organized in order to inform national actors about the objective and opportunities offered by SCO, to present the national and international dimension of its organization, to explain the process of setting up project and present some success stories in progress in Morocco and in other countries. The second approach is to build a network of partners around school projects tailored to national priorities. However, the, specificity, the specificities of school projects, which are particularly short-term with well-defined and high-impact operational objective, require three main points for their implementation. The first one is that topics must be defined by the institutional partners and fall within the framework of national strategies and promoting simple generic needs that can easily be transposed and to other regions at the national level. The second point is that this co-project must be based on existing experiences as well as existing methodology while ensuring the process of adaptation to the specificities of the needs and the fields, they must all be based on previously qualified human resources. And the third point is the commitment and complementarity between partners who are end users, universities, and foreign institutions by providing co-financing and good synergy between the operational and research development aspect. The private sector involvement is still not mature enough today. The example of IRISAT SCO project in Morocco was set up with this philosophy. The project aims to set up a platform for the production and dissemination of indicators for the optimization of irrigation water resources at different spatio-temporal scales. This project is part of the national water strategy and the green generation strategy 250 and 2030. In this context, agreement with the ministerial department concerned has been signed. This project meets the needs of watershed agencies, agricultural development offices, and farmers. For example, indicators on water consumption by crops, biomass, or water productivity. It is based on the synergy and complementarity of two previous projects developed by the CRTS, by the one hand, and the CESBIO ERD, in the other hand. And also, it is based on committed partnership, bringing together national users, universities, international institutions, and formalized by agreements. The research action aims to improve the quality and validity of the indicators generated. The co-financing approach between partners has been adopted. As you know, financial resources are crucial for the success of this type of project, especially in the African region. A special attention must be paid by the school to the mobilization of the funding resources, particularly from development agencies and international donors. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this, for all this explanation about how the whole, basically, the whole country has been working on this project to 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 provide very very operational tool. And I wanted to have your opinion about the develop uh, development of Earth observation based tools for adaptation in Africa. Uh, do you think uh, the SCO and the, the way the project are put up uh, can, be, uh, can be useful for, for the development? Sure. In uh, Africa, there needs to develop uh, tools based in EU for adaptation to climate change are huge and urgent. Topics such as water resources, food security, natural risk management, and uh, also energy security are all priorities. Great progress have been made in recent years through the African Space Program, and particularly GMS Africa, which is now in the second phase, and where the first phase has enabled the implementation of a number of EU platforms and services in both terrestrial and marine environment. 
other international program also contribute to this dynamic. But the SCO is particularly by its organizational and model ensuring a close link between the international level and the national and local level. And also the portfolio of projects that fall within the sustainable development objectives which are shared and documented. And also information sharing and communication platforms could also contribute significantly to the strengthening of development of EU-based services for adaptation to climate change. Through the SCO, national institutions and African universities could benefit from experiences developed elsewhere, leading to time saving, reinforce the platform of exchange information and research activity, and also to develop new services or strengthen existing services by improving techniques, products, and ensure their duplication in other geographical area. And finally, to encourage integration of the private sector as a stakeholder in the value chain of EU services. We are strongly convinced that international cooperation is a key factor for successful action based on space technology. And in line with this vision, CRTS and CNES are joined their effort to organize an international conference on space of climate change dedicated to African countries. This conference is planned to take place in Rabat next April, and we invite all actors to join us and support this initiative. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. You have emphasized a lot about capacity development, regional cooperation, um, when we talk about the use of uh, Earth Observation Climate Service, and this is really, it's true in Africa. It is also true in South America. So I'm now going to turn uh, to, turn to uh, Rosa Maria uh, Ramirez, uh, as I presented you as um, the head of international affairs. And you have a, a great experience on international uh, collaboration for climate. This is why we have you over here. And uh, we, wanted to, we wanted to know, in your opinion, um, why it may be hindering the regional coordination, coordination around the use of uh, Earth observation for climate adaptation. And, and how, how do you think the SCO could act as an umbrella uh, to favor this regional cooperation as we have seen with Amal also how important it is? Thank you, thank you very much for everything. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, let me tell you something strange that it happened in Mexico. In uh, 1985, uh, September 19, we had an uh, earthquake at uh, Scale Richard A.5. Uh, as well, in uh, the last uh, September 2017, and the same day, uh, uh, on September 19, we have an other earthquake, uh, 7.8. Yesterday, mm -hmm. we have an earthquake, a strong earthquake, that uh, enriched the scale at 7.8. 7.4. Yeah, on the same day. Uh, yes, no, we heard same it. day. I can believe. So I have a question. Can I be, begin with after, uh, before asking, uh, give you the answer uh, for your question uh, with some introduction or can I? You, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> oh, uh, it's the first time. Please, it's please. It's the first time that's a lawyer some, some It's all right. So that, well, because it is, I, I believe it is very important. Yes. Okay. Uh, because I lost the, the vision in the, in the side. I, I want to begin my presentation with a brief summary of the most important milestone regarding the international cooperation action in relation to climate change, seen from a ret retrospective point of view. Firstly, it is important to mention that the International Academy of Astronautics 
has played a catalytic role in the organization of Summit for the Head of State Agencies since its first meeting in Washington, D.C. in November 2010. For key areas of cooperation, were identified at the first meeting, exploration robotics, human spirit flight, climate change, and disaster management. One of the most important reference of the Latin American and Caribbean region was the promotion of the Academy Summit, which together with the Mexican Space Agency, convened the agency and institution related to disaster management and climate change. There were three meetings, two were held in Bogota, Colombia, and hosted by the, then by the president of the country, and one uh, was held in Lima, Peru, and hosted by the Space Agency of Peru Canada. On September 17 and 18, 2015, the summit on climate change was held in Mexico City. A declaration was adopted and the head of space agency around the world with the great support of the CNES and uh, the president of CNES at that time, uh, Jean Legal, Dr. Jean Legal, presented it at uh, COP21 in Paris, France, and even which the in the Paris Agreement was adopted. Another important reference is the One Planet Summit, promoted by the President Emmanuel Macron, in which it was recognized that we will have a role to play. That is, there was a necessity for collective effort, governance, public bodies, economic actors, society, and each one of us. Mexico understands that the challenge of climate change change, as the French president pointed out, requires a comprehensive perspective that increases adaptive capacity, strengthened resilience, and reduced vulnerability to climate change. In this sense, it is through collaborative and innovative action that programs and projects that show sustainable and inclusive solutions can be generated. Resulting from the first One Planet Summit, the head of the space agency, with the support of CNES, the Sound National Spatial made new commitment in 2017. After what, we began to work on the creation of the Climate Change Space Observatory, SEO, which required all active commitment to the adoption of the Charter for Everyone's Well Being. We must not lose sight of the fact that in 2015, there were reconsideration of the matter, the Sendai Summit on Disaster Management, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, UNAID, SDG. Air observation and space technology, particularly remote sensing, is intimately linked to each of the elements of the Sustainable Development Agenda. Air observation and space technology, particularly remote sensing, is intimately linked to each of the elements of the Sustainable Development Agenda. The agreements will have to be resolved again. I must not omit that at the Unispace Plus 50 High Level Conference in 2018, a resolution was adopted regarding the elaboration of the Space 23 Agenda and its implementation plan which was approved in the UNA Resolution 26.3 on October 28, 21. The entire agenda involved cooperation in all aspects, air observation and space technology. How could developed countries have access to space-based data? Promote international cooperation to strengthen early warning system using satellite technology for risk prediction. International cooperation to access space-based space data for sustainable development. Exchange of experiences related to the use of space-based data, data processing, best practices. Support of startups and young entrepreneurs through business incubator, prices and competition to software products, etc. Skill development, imagine processes use of tool developed products, facilitation of space data to research and innovation program methodologies, algorithms. Exchange of knowledge between the agency in charge of disaster response. 
the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration of the United States of America, NOAA, donated 10 receiving, this is cooperation, insertion of the Geonis Cast America system to incorporate Mexico into the GNCA network, and this network operates around the world. The system provides environmental and meteorological information and data from air observation satellite useful for weather forecasting, ill warning against floods, droughts, and hurricanes, among others. Established laboratories with technology responsible for measuring gas concentration throughout the atmospheric column, as well as carrying out wide ranging research source and natural hurricane and wildfires and or man made deforestation disturbances. The National Autonomous University of Mexico, the National Institute of Ecology and Climate Change, and the AGM started the project of the Mexican Observatory of Climate and Atmospheric Composition, OMECA, installing of air station that will allow the validation of data generated by the GeoCar satellite geostationary qual cycle observatory of NASA. This will allow us to improve the understanding of the carbon cycle and other actions in advance the objectives of appliance, space science, and technology to tasks that benefit life here on Earth. I have time? No, I think we, we, okay. I, I'm very aware of the time, and we have uh, three okay. other speakers, so I, I, I'm afraid we have to, to stop here. It's very, uh, very important to hear about how we, how the, the cooperation, uh, the, the cooperation has worked between public and private, how all these many initiatives, uh, gathering many, many initiatives is a very important step forward to ensure that uh, we make the most of Earth observation to adapt to society. But also one main question we have uh, yeah. when we are working together in the SCO is actually how uh, data and tools may, must be widely uh, and readily available and uh, by by those who actually need it. This is the, what, what we call the last mile question and last mile problem we have. How the data that we have, we have many, many of them and how they are actually used and correspond to the needs of the end users. So I have to turn, I have to, turn to Stefan Mermoz about this and whose company Globeo is behind the Tropisco project. And before we smooth to the Tropisco project, we have a little uh, film if, the, if we can if we can project it uh, right now. Thank you. Forests cover about 30% of the Earth's land area and provide many ecosystem services to humanity, such as climate change mitigation with carbon sinks. Tropical forests, in particular, constitute only 6% of the land area and are home to more than half of the Earth's biodiversity. Unfortunately, forests are disappearing at an alarming rate. It is in this context that the Tropisco project was born. This project is the result of a collaboration between CES Bio Laboratory and CNES and the Global EI Design Office. The aim of the project is to create a platform for near real-time monitoring of tropical dense forest loss using Sentinel-1 radar images. The use of radar imaging technology ensures faster detection of forest loss up to 12 days regardless of the cloud cover. The Tropisco project benefits from the close collaboration with partner countries in the Amazon, Congo and Southeast Asia's basins to adapt forest loss detection to local specificities and needs. The Tropisco platform is accessible to everyone at www.tropisco.org and currently provides forest loss maps in Gabon, French Guyana, Suriname, Guyana, Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia. The platform hosts an interactive map and allows to visualize forest loss from 2018 to present at the national and local scale. With a minimum mapping unit of 0.1 hectare, forest loss temporal evolution may be observed using a dedicated timeline. Forest loss areas are color-coded according to the detection date and associated to a confidence indicator. In addition, annual and monthly forest loss statistics are provided for each region and country. The platform also allows to compare Tropisco data with GLAD data 
which is a reference in the field of forest loss detection based on optical imagery. Data can be downloaded directly as a GeoTIFF file or browsed via a WMS protocol. Data may be used, for example, for combating illegal logging and mining, illegal agricultural crops and wildlife tracking. Users will therefore be able to work with reliable and frequently updated data. Yeah, we're very proud of this project. It actually has been presented during the One Planet Summit on Biodiversity by, uh, by the, the French President uh, Macron. So we are, we are really happy to have you over to explain to us how the, uh, now that we've seen that the tool is available online, it's not working. So in practice, how it is used for monitoring and adaptation? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for this opportunity to talk about the project and good morning, uh, everyone. Um, we, d we developed this, uh, this forest monitoring system in collaboration uh, uh, with uh, space agencies and uh, national forest institutes uh, from the beginning. Uh, the, the space agencies provided us with some key data, like uh, uh, forest data, uh, that are in line with the national forest definitions, and it's crucial to get uh, to get uh, accurate forest loss detections. And on the other hand, they uh, they use our data for national monitoring, and uh, to have a clear understanding on, on uh, what's happening on the ground. So uh, it's uh, uh, firstly used uh, by the space agencies and forest institutes like Venice in Vietnam and the Forest Institute FIPI in Vietnam, like uh, AGOS in Gabon or INPI, the space agency in uh, Brazil. Um, for example, currently we are working in close collaboration with Brazil to, to uh, ingest the Tropisco data uh, into their official forest monitoring system. And, um, and it's also uh, uh, widely used by the public sector. So I have a few examples, for example, in, in French Guiana. Uh, in French Guiana, the French uh, national uh, forest um, organization uh, helps uh, um, support uh, the general staff of the fight against uh, illegal gold, gold mining using this data. And uh, uh, another example is, um, is the use of, uh, 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 I, uh, there is, uh, yeah, of the Ministry of Agriculture in, uh, in French Guiana, who uses data to report statistics on smallholder agriculture, which is, uh, which is in general uh, one of the causes of deforestation. So these are some few examples in French Guiana. Uh, also, uh, the NGOs uh, supported from the beginning uh, the creation of the Tropisco project, such as WWF and Greenpeace, so they can use uh, this, this data to, um, to alert the public at large, and um, so that they can, we can all be aware of, of deforestation. So these are the, some of the current use, uses of the data. But there are also some very important potential use of the data, uh, for example, in the frame of uh, international initiatives. Uh, first of all, uh, the, the national and, uh, and, and now European uh, initiative uh, to combat uh, imported deforestation, uh, meaning banning the import of, uh, banning the import of, uh, of agriculture products from uh, illegal uh, deforestation. So this is really, uh, this data are really crucial, or could be really crucial in the, for verification of, of, uh, of, this, uh, of this deforestation. There is also uh, the, the international initiative Red Plus from the UNFCCC. Red Plus meaning reducing emissions due to deforestation and forest degradations. And um, in, this, uh, in this frame, uh, uh, our data uh, jointly used with, uh, with uh, carbon maps uh, could be crucial to estimate uh, carbon emissions from, uh, from deforestation. And that's exactly why we are going to, to put into the tropical system in 2023 uh, some carbon maps, carbon emission maps. And last but not least, there is also, the, for example, the, the farm to fork strategy, which is at the heart of the European Green Deal. And, uh, and again, this data could be used, um, could be used for verification. 
And, um, and uh, I just also wanted to say a word about, uh, about uh, some international, um, some international uh, institutions that foster uh, the use of our data. For example, UNEP is willing to put our data in the, um, in the online platform. And also, uh, I wanted also to, to give a word on, uh, on, um, on the FAO, who is willing also to put our data into their online platform called CEPAL. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this this pro Tropisco project is is a bit different from some 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 of the project we have in SCO because it has many purposes. It's it gives data for um, for NGOs for a very broad public, but it also gives uh, a lot of information and data for the public sector, as you have shown. Uh, we have seen on the map that for the moment you're developing in uh, in Gabon, in Guyana, in Thailand. So basically, you are going to cover the whole tropical uh, tropical area what is your <clears throat> what uh, in which it, in what when will it be um, done and how long uh, this is going to take to to develop the whole program yes yeah, so far we uh, we produce the maps into seven countries which are Vietnam Laos Cambodia in uh, Southeast Asia Gabon in Africa and uh, French Guiana Suriname and um, and Guyana in South America and we are going to cover in 2023 and 24 the world tropics uh, first with Amazonia and Congo Basin and then the world Southeast Asia and we are working in parallel on uh, on um, forest uh, forest uh, deforestation detection in temperate forest and boreal forest as well in parallel and this uh, it's interesting this project has been founded um through the SCO by Agnes, but also by the French minister. Uh, we have to say that because it doesn't happen that often. Uh, but the French minister for foreign affairs, uh, because of its link uh, with international uh, alliance, such as deforestation and so on and so forth. But uh, exactly, and yeah. And I just wanted to add a word that it's a, a lot of research and development, and that ISA as well before that exactly. helped us and funded us exactly. as well. For example, yeah. Exactly. Uh, one cannot achieve such a, such a project with long in a wrong, long run of you know uh, research and so that has been done previously. But mainly of these core projects are uh, coming from lab lab research, and that's why they are robust and they are able in the last in their last mile to develop such services. Yes, so yeah. <laughs> yes, I fully agree. Yeah. It's yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. So we've seen thank that you. we you have applied also new methodologies. You haven't not talked about it because it's very uh, it's, this is very technical. But the, behind that, there are heavy new technologies as well. Uh, yeah, the main thing to remain is that it's based on radar, radar satellite data, and then it works whatever the cloud conditions, whatever the meteorological conditions, which is crucial in the tropics, of course. Yeah. So. I think naturally I'm going to turn uh, turn over to uh, to Simonetta Chelli, uh, as Isa has been playing an important role in this project, uh, in uh, in the upstream part of it. Um, so um, I wanted to I want to discuss uh, about, about the new activity that Isa is expanding um, after after pioneering uh, pioneering in climate change program and data provision through the CCI. So so what is the climate space program and how does it relate um, uh, with the ESA climate change initiative? That's where we wanted to bring, show the bridges we have between uh, ESA work and what we're doing at SCO. Thank you and good morning to everybody. Thank you to CNES, to the SCO team for the invitation. The European Space Agency is 22 member states. We've been working on climate for many years. In fact, ESA was present at the World Summit on Sustainable Development, and since then it's been supporting all the environmental conventions of the United Nations, including Ramsar, desertification, but UNFCC. So the core of what we do in the European Space Agency is building satellite, launching them and operating them, but in 2008, ESA member states decided that was also very important to uh, have a program, the Climate Change Initiative, to be started to integrate data from ESA 
missions, but not only, also from third party missions into supporting climate change, helping those who were doing the models, helping the scientists, and supporting adaptation and mitigation activities in the context of uh, UNFCC. So the CCI was born, we've been working for many years, since 2008, with over 450 scientists in Europe who's, who've been using our data in support of essential climate variables. As you know, in the context of the UNFCC, you have 56 essential climate variables. Half of those can be supported with space data. And ESA started in 2008 working on 14 of those variables. So looking with scientists, integrating data from our missions to indicators which were related to sea level rise deforestation, uh, but also quality of the air and other topics. And today we are currently working on 22 climate variables and with the Climate Space Initiative, which is actually the program we are presenting to ministers for subscription and the next ministerial in Paris in two months. It's a program that it's an enhancement of the CCI program. It's a program which will further develop uh, the user requirements, which are evolving, the evolving user requirements on the COP agreement of Paris, which will enhance further research on research on methodologies, the one Stefan mentioned, is certainly relevant because that's part of the core of what ESA does, supporting scientists and researchers for developing new methodologies and also working with scientists to increase the number of variables and of course strengthen the international collaboration with UNFCC, with SABSTA, but also with SCO, because this is what we've been doing since the SCO inception. We were also at the Planet uh, Summit, and we've been working very closely with the SCO initiative to see how best, uh, I would say, valorize the work that's done in the context of the agency and the work that SCO does in terms of creating visibility for climate initiatives. Yeah, so, uh, more precisely, what is the, the synergy, the complementary you're involved in in um, some projects? So we would like to hear about these uh, this different uh, cooperation. We have a project we have cooperated. Yeah, the, the cooperation with SCO has been uh, a good one in the sense that I was saying it's put in uh, visibility what we do in the context of a program of visa, not just the CCI, but a program which is very relevant for us is called Futurio. In fact, the number of activities activities in the context of Futuro, which are also related to the demonstration of the application and the use, the exploitation of the Earth observation data from our missions, but not only from his emissions, have been labeled SCO. In fact, four activities in the context of the Futuro program have a SCO labeling, and that's very important for the collaboration because the collaboration it also creates visibility. Uh, just to think about, some, I'll mention some of this program. We had some slides, but I think there they were not available in the end. Uh, one of those projects is related to a prediction of cholera in India, and it's a very relevant one in this context. And the other one is on uh, uh, developing uh, activities on resilience on the West Africa coast. So the international collaboration dimension there are very important, not just among Giza countries, but with partners and also with co-partners, because you have a lot of uh, uh, subscribers at this point, I think over 17. Giza just signed the Co charter last June in Toulouse. And other examples of projects which are very concrete projects include, for example, heat wave in cities. And we've all lived uh, very strong heat waves in cities this summer. And you can do a lot with satellites to look into that, to forecast and predict those heat waves, not only in terms of looking at the temperature of the ground, but also looking at the air evolution and supporting that with satellites. So that's the type of thing we do. And on top of that, the collaboration between these activities which have more a global nature. We have satellites which look very much at variables which have a, a global connotation. SCO is also looking at regional and local dimensions. And so it's very complementary what we do in the context of climate uh, initiative and hopefully the climate space that will be subscribed at the ministerial and, and the SCO activities. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you for mentioning this project because uh, what I, I would like to, to underscore and to, to stress the fact that the idea behind this project is that once they've been developed in an area and being fostered by ESA, for example, they can be reused in another area and shared. And, and that's why we can use this data and customize them and apply them in another place in the world. And that's where the whole added value of the in terms of capacity building, in terms of helping vulnerable countries, is is extremely important. So now we have we have witnessed lots of projects. We have seen how, how the different type of topics they can tackle. You've been talking about epidemiology, about cholera. This is very important. When we heard about uh, natural disasters, we've heard about forests, agriculture, heat waves in the city, coastline uh, coastline problems and stuff like that. So we've we've seen all those different topics. So you can imagine the sheer amount of databases that 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 are that exist. You're even talking about more more data, more services, and they can be uh, they will be leveraged in the future in the context of space for climate. And this is where obviously uh, I go to you, uh, Sharin, um, as head of a secretariat and in your science policy business forum for the environment, because. Um, you, uh, you will explain to us how this international cooperation around satellite-based environmental data has evolved. This is what you do on a daily basis, how such data are being used for decision making. This is what you promote and, and what you organize through, uh, through the, the program you're running. Thank you very much, Laurence, and uh, thank you all for uh, being part of this uh, incredible effort today and the work of the school to try and further the use of uh, satellite-based environmental data for climate change. Well, I'll start by saying this. Uh, in terms of international cooperation, the world is not on track to meet any of the environmental goals today. And this is not because of lack of data. So there is always a, a huge demand for more uh, data, for more uh, knowledge uh, based on the data, uh, yet are we using it to scale and are we using it fast enough and are we actually making a difference? So SCO was uh, with us in Stockholm just a few months ago uh, when the United Nations, when the world marked 50 years of environmental multilateralism. And one of the conclusions was the multilateral system has so far been less than optimal in meeting those environmental goals. And it becomes not a question of just data, but it becomes a question of the positioning of the science as the basis for decision making, something that we all need to make a concerted effort to make work and to make happen. So I'll just refer here uh, to um, just a few uh, milestones in this journey and where it takes us today and how to move forward. So very quickly, um, basically since the launch of the first weather satellite in 1959, Earth observations and satellite-based data has proven to be vital tools for creating solid scientific foundations for policy action. And a very good example for that, I think possibly the best example of that, is that in 1984, the Earth Radiation Budget Satellite provided an early insight into how human activities, such as burning fossil fuels, affect the planet's radiation balance and helped us discover the hole in the ozone layer. Now, the, minima, the, the convention, the, the Montreal Protocol, uh, basically uh, resulted, uh, was a result uh, of this and was born out of this discovery and has since become the most effective UN brokered multilateral agreement ever made with 100% compliance rate. So why? Why did we find uh, a situation here where data actually triggered action at this scale, allowing the world to change and do a full U-turn uh, but maybe not in other areas. And uh, what we found here is a clear example of data to knowledge and knowledge to action. 
It's the dynamic and accountability that was triggered by the data in this case that made success possible. Now, data triggered action by the UN to convene, governments to regulate, industry to comply, society to engage and monitor, research and development, which doesn't happen in government, but happens in the private sector, research and development to provide alternatives to harmful substances, academia, the private sector, it's a very important part of the equation. And then finally, oversight, accurate measurements and oversight to uphold accountabilities. So data here is really a trigger, a catalyst, but also a tool, not only for knowledge, but to with uphold accountabilities. So two decades later, the orbiting carbon observatory mission gave us the first glimpse of global maps of carbon dioxide concentration around the world. Yet we remain far from achieving the Paris Agreement, maybe because some of these elements, not only the political will, but the entire dynamic is still lacking and definitely need, we need to do something about it. Um, so the, so the conclusion maybe it could be this. We need to do more to ensure that the data and the knowledge based on this data is delivered on time and at a scale to all. Because if we listen to developing countries and the least developed countries, we will see here a big question on equity and empowerment, including gender empowerment that we need to take into consideration. So data, the availability of it, and the place of science in society is foundational to any effort to save the planet. At the same time, we need to create the right dynamic to link the use of this data together with the policy, industry, and societal action. Um, data is essential because we cannot manage what we cannot measure. Um, now, on data accessibility and empowerment, um, we need to remember that in order to be able to provide information and knowledge at scale, AI technologies today has become an enormous tool, but the question is, is it used at the scale required? Um, maybe not. And at the same time, these technologies, uh, and I know that uh, the European uh, Commission is working a lot of that, it's part of the new vision for the future, but we're not quite there because the ethical, transparent, and regulatory mechanisms are still lacking. The regulation of how we use these tools, who does the data belong to once you put it through the churning machine of AI, and uh, the integrity of this data is still a big question and it's still something that the international community needs uh, to work on. And then finally, again, uh, the issue of equity and the issue of uh, leaving no one behind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this. Thank you, all of you, uh, for, this, for the, your participation to this session. And you've said, Sharon, um, we are indeed in a very critical, critical path now. And all of us in the, uh, in the space sector are willing to play our part to use this data, provide, uh, provide tools to help the, the, all the vulnerable territories and, and people um, all over the world with what we can do, uh, our platform or tools. So that's what we're doing here. And the SCO, thanks to all its partners, is, is, trying, is trying to do this. But remember, we have to do it in a sustainable way. It's not because we are helping people that we, not, we don't have to think how sustainable we are ourselves in the way we're working, we're doing our mission and activities. So on this, on this conclusion, I, I leave you and I hope you have a very nice day here in, in Paris, in ESC. Thank you very much, all of you, and, and have a good day. Thank you.